Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another guest that I am excited for this weekend, but first off, I just wanted to give you guys a quick notice. Um, For those of you who may have had some trouble with the audio quality of my interview with Lev Albert, if you didn't catch the announcement on the Perpetual Chess Facebook group, uh, or excuse me, if you didn't follow me on Twitter, just wanted to let you guys know that we have a transcript of that interview now available. So there's a lot of uh, historical nuggets there. Uh, Lev obviously had so much knowledge to share. So if you had any trouble with that, you can either go to the webpage of the Lev Albert, Lev Albert interview, or you can even just go on uh, Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform to that show description, and there's a link to the transcript. So if you couldn't figure out what we were saying, uh, hopefully now you can read it and enjoy that interview. So with that out of the way, I wanted to get to this week's guest for whom I am also excited with whom I am also excited to speak. Uh, He is the co-founder of uh, a chess educational startup that I know a lot of listeners are quite familiar with and are fans with called Chessable. Uh, He's also a video game designer. He is a chess player and an adult improver himself. Uh, Born in Russia, lives in London, joining us from London. David Cramley, thank you for coming on Perpetual Chess. Hi, Ben. Uh, yes, thanks so much for inviting me, for having me. I'm excited as well. Um, been listening to a few of your podcasts. It's um, great stuff. Uh, so thanks for doing this. Thanks. I appreciate it. And people who listen to this show regularly will probably know that this is this is one I'm especially excited for. First of all, as I've mentioned in the past, I'm a fan, a big fan of the product, Chessable. I think it's, it's the best thing out there for, uh, you know, a best learning tool out there for helping people uh, memorize things they need to memorize as improving chess players, whether it be openings or, you know, specific uh, tactics and sequences and stuff like that. And also just the intersection of the the things that you're working on. I mean, I love chess. And of course, I'm interested in all aspects of chess, but business in particular, and sort of how to grow a business as you um, in, in the chess world is something of particular interest to me. So I'm eager to hear your story. So of course, I've been digging in a bit and know some about your background. But I think for our listeners, it's best to to hear it from you uh, yourself. So why don't you tell us about how, how the idea for Chessable? Well, why don't you first explain briefly the what Chessable does? Uh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So w- with Chessable, we, we started with helping you memorize and understand opening lines um so it was born out of frustration of just not remembering your openings but um obviously where we got the openings from were some print opening books so we kind of thought about what the next step would be and it would be to expand it to all kinds of books so today chessable can help you memorize and, and again understand the contents of any uh type of book it could be end game tactics strategy uh, and the way it does this is by by using learning science, in, in particular space repetition, uh, which makes sure that you review the concepts at particular intervals of time uh, that get longer and longer as you go along until you, eventually you have to review things maybe like once every three months or something. So it gets really good at um, kind of figuring out what you should review tomorrow and what you can leave for next week, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, and for listeners who may have heard my interview with cognitive science Christopher Chabri, he mentioned space repetition as sort of being at the vanguard of, uh, you know, cognitive science research. So the fact that that we have uh, this this entrant into the chess educational landscape is is a wonderful thing, and it's very user friendly. Um, I recently played a tournament for the the first time in many months, and I would prefer to avoid talking about the results of that tournament, but <laughs> but it wasn't Chessable's fault. It did an awesome job, and I was able to, to upload some repertoires and yeah. really dig in, and my openings actually went quite well in, in no small part thanks to Chessable. So I, I, you know, I'm not... Not a paid representative, but just want to say it's an awesome <laughs> product. And if anyone hasn't checked it out, I encourage you to. Um, and in digging into your your background, it was funny that you mentioned that that you started 
Chessable basically to solve your own problem. They, they, you were aware of the research regarding space repetition, but couldn't find anything on the market that helped you review books. Th that's right. Yeah. So I had been watching opening videos, trying to read a couple of opening books. And then when the time came to play, I just couldn't remember a thing, you know, and um, I I'm usually quite decent at learning things, you know, <laughs> so I realized that chess is this particularly uh, difficult uh, subject. So probably up there were like physics or something where uh, sometimes due to the transpositions and the move orders, uh, you really need to review things. Um, and yeah, I was aware of space repetition uh, based on my language learning, actually. So uh, I thought, well, this should exist for chess. And uh, I looked at a few things that were out there and none quite kind of like fit the bill. So, you know, uh, I had just finished uh, working on my previous startup. I had some spare time. So I spent a few days just coding a, a basic prototype of this and, and using it myself. Um, what languages do you speak, David? Uh, so I speak English, Spanish, Russian, uh, Portuguese on intermediate level and um, probably beginner German. <laughs> wow, that's Im that's impressive. And yeah, it's um, it it's uh. So you came up with the idea for Chessable, um, and then you said you spent a few days coding. And I mm. I know that you've you've written online, you've done some interviews and uh, written some posts about your your previous experience uh, with a startup. So why don't you just give our listeners a, a brief background about that and how that sort of frames sure. your experience for Chessable. So I finished my undergrad in 2008, uh, at Queens college in New York. Um, and back then I think Facebook was just up and coming and, um, they were kind of putting out calls for developers to join the platform and develop apps. And, you know, I was a keen gamer, played lots of video games in my time. And, um, I thought, well, what should, should I do? Um, it's my last year at, uh, at, at uni. Uh, let's try and make a few games for Facebook. Um, and yeah, so that's how it all kicked off. Uh, I wrote a couple games. You know, some took me a weekend, some took me a week, some took me two weeks. Uh, and a couple of them took off, and people really enjoyed them. We built a community around it. And that growth uh, just kept going until, yeah, we had enough money to to hire people and um, try and build into a company. Um but, um, I mean, I don't know how much detail you want to know on this, but eventually um, things things change in that area. It got, it got really competitive um, the more Facebook grew. And, um, I mean, Facebook's huge nowadays. So, um, yeah, quite a few lessons to take away from that. I'm trying to, to make sure that I implement them while building Chessable and um, so, so as to, to have the best chances of, of building a great product without falling into the same pitfalls. So what were a few of the pitfalls? Um, so a big one was, I guess, marketing uh, in the sense that yeah, back when you're younger, you, you, you might hear this as a programmer that if you build it, they'll come. You know, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's good enough, they'll come. And, and it's, it's really not true. <laughs> you do need marketing. <laughs> um, but when Facebook was kind of young, they took all the marketing onto themselves. So they gave you all these cool tools that you could use um, to tap into their marketing. Uh, and that worked for us, and that's how we grew. But eventually, Facebook withdrew the support uh, uh, under you with, with the marketing. Uh, and they said, well, now we want you guys to use our paid marketing platform, right? Um, and you better have been collecting your users' emails and you know emailing them yourself because now you can't use our notification system that kind of thing. So as soon as Facebook withdrew their support with marketing, our traffic kind of collapsed and we didn't really have a mailing list. Um, we didn't really have that kind of marketing relationship with our customers and um, it kind of all fell apart like a house of cards. Wow, that's, that's a bad break. I mean, I, certainly there are lessons you can learn from that, but, but it yeah. you know, didn't, have to fall, didn't have to shake out that way either. They didn't no, have no, to pull it, the rug it, out it, from it. under you. It didn't, but I think it is an important lesson because if we had had um, our own marketing efforts, uh, you know, alongside theirs, then even if they stopped doing their bit, we could have still um, survived, as many other companies did. You know, there were several well-funded um, Silicon Valley-based um, social game companies that that were doing just that, so they were fine. <laughs> right, and you and you mentioned in an interview I read that you, when you did launch Chessable, you got like five thousand email addresses right away, so. That's right. Um, yeah. So how were you how were you able to do that? I mean, so how what was the practical uh implication of uh what you learned from from your experience with the video game startup and how you changed it when Chessable launched? 
Um, so I really wanted a co-founder that would um, complement my skill set. And um, I think marketing uh, was one point there. And the other one would be to be a good chess teacher, a good chess coach, uh, a good chess player, which, you know, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so well, yeah, For listeners, uh, you're about 1,800 feet day, right? Uh, yeah, 18, 1850. Yeah. So you're, so you're being a, you're being a bit modest. You're uh, firmly uh, above average. <laughs> yeah, but you know, comparing myself to 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 all these amazing players out there, like like my co-founder John Bartholomew, um, I'm I'm way below that. So <laughs> in that light, yeah, watching John's videos is a humbling experience for me too. Exactly. Yeah. So um, so yeah, that was like that lesson put to to practice straight away. Um. Just, I, I basically said I am not doing this unless I find a co-founder who will complement my skills, who will bring some marketing on board, who will uh, know about chess uh, in, in places that I don't. And I mean, uh, for example, 100 Endgames You Must Know was a, a book that John recommended that we bring onto the site. And, and it was a great recommendation. You know, he knows that kind of stuff inside out. So, so yeah, that lesson was put into practice straight away uh, in finding a co-founder, really. And it was an excellent choice. I mean, obviously, he's a, you kind of caught a rising star. I mean, he he was he already had a big YouTube following at the time, but it's only uh, got, only gotten bigger yeah. since then. Yeah, I mean, when I when I watch his videos, I think he had about three thousand followers. So wow, <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah I, so. I definitely caught a rising star. And um, but yeah, I mean, I really enjoy watching his videos. I enjoyed his uh, his teaching style, and um, yeah, it, it's been awesome. And so you sent an email to John without even knowing him. Um, and you guys ended up corresponding. I'm just sort of uh, synthesizing what I've learned in That's my research. Right. Uh, and then how did it go once you did talk to him? Was he just immediately on board or did it take some convincing? Uh, I think it would take some convincing for anyone. I mean, <laughs> it's just, you know, this random person telling you about their great chess idea. Um, <laughs> you have to convince anyone, right? Um, and um, yeah, it was a very short email at first saying, you know, I've got this idea and one line about my background, do you want to hear more? And, and you know, you have to be careful with cold emails. You don't want to um, to, to annoy people when they don't know you yet. So, uh, yeah, I was just testing the waters. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, I, I would love to hear more about it. So then second email, he, he knew a bit more about it, and then he liked it, and then we scheduled a Skype call, and then after the Skype call, we scheduled a meeting in person, which coincidentally was working out well because he was due to travel to London uh, in a few weeks or something. Um and yeah, I mean, it was just taking it step by step um, to, yeah, to see if we would, you know, get on if we both liked the idea, if we both believed in it. And how long was it from your initial email to John to uh, announcing the product? Uh, to announcing the product, uh, when did we announce it? <laughs> um, we must have announced it in January or something. Uh, so three months, maybe. That's pretty impressive. Pretty pretty quick turnaround. Pretty quick launch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was already a working prototype that John um, was able to to test out. And um, I think what quite convinced him back then was I had added a few lines from this Nidorf book um, for, for Black. And uh, I think I showed him the theory up to like move 21 for a few lines, like perfectly. And, um, <laughs> and, and um, yeah, he was quite impressed with that and convinced that the method actually helps you remember these things. Yeah, it it does for sure. I mean, and I'm someone who... Uh, you know, I my chess development preceded even the computer age, so I go back yeah. to the the MCO opening volumes, and you know, I, I remember wow. p- putting your hand over the the book, uh, trying to remember lines, and it's just so inefficient compared to to the chessable software, where it it remembers specifically the things that you forgot, and then uh-huh. you know periodically brings them back. So I, I mean, I just want to thank you as a chess enthusiast for for making this product. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> so it's it's seen consistent growth. Um, what what have been the biggest challenges uh, uh, in the in the course of uh, growing this company over the intervening couple of years? Uh, chessable. Uh huh. So I think. W- I mean, I underestimated the challenges that come with um, bringing books to life, which is, you know, what we're trying to do, like taking this great course by, say, Dorietsky and, and putting it into Chessable or the Woodpecker Method and bringing it to Chessable. Uh, each print book is quite unique and has its nuances. And um, when you bring it in, uh, sometimes or most of the time, your existing feature set just doesn't cut it. So you have to keep developing the software. You have to keep adjusting. And um, there's always a surprise in store. Um, and yeah, it just takes a lot longer than, than you think it will. Um, it's a lot more work. And when you make a deal with uh, with these authors, so 
I know mm-hmm. you've you've collaborated with uh, Christoph Sulecki, aka Chess Explained a lot, and uh, Alex Kolovich. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Is another frequent collaborator, and also as you mentioned, you know you've got well known, uh, popular books that have been mentioned on this very podcast, from 100 End Games You Must Know to some Susan Polgar books. So you've got a lot of well known books, but once you decide it's going to be adapted, who does the work of adapting it? Uh, yeah, so there there are different stages. I mean, for some of these courses, we actually have to recreate the PGM because one doesn't exist. So um, when I say it's a lot of work, <laughs> I mean it. Um, but yeah, I, I think everybody in the team chips in. Um, uh, for some courses, there'll be yeah, one particular team member responsible for the majority of it. But um, yeah, I think we, all of us have done some at some point and uh, all of the team has had at least one course uh, to their name, basically. And... How many employees would you say you have now? I mean, I know you have uh, authors that are sort of on a freelance basis, but uh, so how how do you categorize your number of employees? So we are four people full time and about six to eight part time, and we're looking to make it six full time uh, by January. So that's great. About that. That's great that that you're growing. And for listeners, David, like myself, is a father of a young child, and this is your your full time work now, correct? Yeah, a hundred percent. Full time and then some, from from what I've read. <laughs> oh yeah, I've been working since six in the morning today. Um, so if I if I sound a bit slow or something, that's probably why. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh four thirty p.m. London time right now, and of course three thirty, three thirty, three thirty. Sorry, and uh, yeah. we've we've got the the world championship coming up, and you guys are doing an event for that, and you you know you also part of the reason we wanted to do this interview now is you've got some some announcements you wanted to make. So uh, why don't you go ahead and inform our listeners about what what's coming, for, what new things are coming for Chessable. Uh, well, so yeah, you, you mentioned it's uh, their, uh, the World Chess Championship is happening. So we're putting on an, an event on November 20th in the evening. Um, and everybody is welcome to come. It's free of charge. There are a few uh, chess uh, streamers and YouTubers coming. John's going to be there. Christoph's going to be there. Um, we've had a few big GM names say they're going to come, but uh, I'm not going to mention any names uh, just in case they change their mind, you know, right. but it should be a really really great evening and um yeah we're looking forward to meeting some of these people some of these masters and, and some of the chessable users and if, even if you don't use chessable and you just play chess just come around and have some fun uh it's happening at the Battersea chess club and yeah we're looking forward to that so um, i'll so i'll put a note to that in the show description for any listeners who are either living in london or planning on making the trip i'm jealous of you if you are both, <laughs> both for the world championship and for the party so um and, and uh, what else do you have uh, coming out? I saw this. I saw today, uh, Leon Watson, your um, one who, of your colleagues, yeah, yeah, one of your colleagues uh, mentioned that you guys um, are collaborating with New in Chess for for one of Christoph Zulicki's books, his E4 repertoire. Yeah. So, so what actually happened is um, Christoph wrote "Keep It Simple" one E4 for Chessable exclusively, but um, it, it had such a great reception that New in Chess. Um, started working with him directly to make it into a print book uh, and you know we've been bringing chess books to life from print book to to online for a while but this is the first time that we've got something that appeared online on chessable and has made it into a print book which we think it's it's quite cool and, and makes us all quite happy and, and just motivated to keep going yeah that's great it's like it's a two-way street now <laughs> yeah uh, so uh, yeah, actually as part of that we're doing um one thousand dollar prize giveaway so it's completely free to enter if anybody wants to um there hopefully you can put a link below as well um you can win a lesson with Christoph. you can win a signed copy of his print book um that kind of stuff sounds great um and you know i'm uh, already on the record of being a big fan of uh Christoph's <laughs> youtube videos for so i i think our regular listeners will know that but you should check him out if you haven't and he also uh is releasing a book coming up right yeah, he has uh, a world championship kind of themed course. Uh, I mean, it's actually a complete repertoire for black against 1E4, uh, based on 1E4, E5. And, and it's all based around Fabiano Carano's games. Uh, so he actually recommends things like Carano would play himself, like the Petrov, which he has used to some success. And um, yeah, it's, you know, it's on the rise. People are finding a new interest in that opening. So that's coming out next monday so a week from today so if anybody is interested in that and christoph's work is awesome that do check it out 
Okay, yeah. And uh, yeah, the Petrov is definitely an opening that has uh, stood the test of time. I remember Karpov playing it a lot in my youth. And then when I had Jan Gustafsson on um, uh, the second time, I just, you know, Jan is world authority on uh, openings. And I just happened to ask him about like, why did the Petrov fall in popularity and rise again? And apparently it was uh, black was having trouble with the line where white uh, plays knight c3 and castles queenside. Yeah. But, but Fabi has found some antidotes against that. And Kristoff does a great job distilling ideas. So um, anyone looking for a repertoire against d4, I'm sure it's going to be a great product. And again, yeah, I'll I'll link to that as well. Um, so you mentioned you've been working a, a long day, David. Um, so I can't even imagine. I mean, I've read some of your sort of life hacker posts and stuff about uh, your general uh, life as a startup finder. But what's your what's your day to day life like as f- in your work for Chessable? Uh, you know, I try to make a few solid hours where I can concentrate on work, and that's. Um, that's easier to do in the mornings. Uh, I feel like I have more energy and um, like I'm on top of things. But then other than that, it's try to find, you know, an hour or two or half an hour to work any time of the day, really, because uh, as you mentioned before, I've got a kid, so I do have to um, give her some attention, too. So, um, yeah, it's just a, really a big balancing act. Uh, but um, if anybody is trying to do something like this, my recommendation would be that you do have like one main chunk where you know you're most productive uh, and make sure you don't miss that because that's when the magic happens. Yeah, yeah. Interruptions, they, they talk about switching costs cognitively. Where, For sure, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. every, every time you pick up your phone or something. like it's... Uh, I, I don't pick up my phone and I mean, I have to apologize if anybody tries calling me, but I, I try and schedule my calls like so so that you don't get interrupted, you know, with something something new. I mean, unless it's a real big emergency, uh, I just try to, to leave it. And if somebody rings me three times, then I know, okay, something important must be happening and then I'll pick up. But, but otherwise, um, yeah, as you say, uh, minimize interruptions and and try and concentrate. Yeah, and how much of your work is spent coding uh, versus the uh, sort of CEO type big picture vision stuff that you also have to work yeah. on? Yeah, um, I mean, it would be nice if the CEO stuff was um, <laughs> big picture and vision stuff. Um, <laughs> actually, um, who was it? I think it was Elon Musk who said something like, um, like all the all the bad jobs fall on the CEO as the company is growing. And that's because, you know, uh, your team members are already full on with the responsibility. So anything that falls outside their scope that, you know, might be a bit boring, might be a bit annoying and needs doing, you do it. So so actually, it's a lot of like, again, juggling and, and, and just getting things done. And um, the more the company grows, the less time I have for actually developing myself. So I'm not really doing much programming um, lately unfortunately i mean as much as i want to um but the, the benefit of that is that we are training a few more team members to to learn the whole chessable code base and um and eventually they'll get more and more features done uh, and code hopefully as well uh, as i can who who wrote the initial code base you know and do you miss coding yeah yeah i mean you know the grass is always greener on the other side right <laughs> right yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, of course, I miss coding, and um, I do plan to try and make bigger chunks for that in 2019. So that's part of the reason I'm hoping to be able to expand the full-time um, team size. Uh, we can do that successfully. Uh, hopefully, I'll get a, you know, a few days in a row just coding uh, and get some cool stuff done because we definitely have a huge backlog of, of ideas and improvements that everybody could enjoy. Uh, are you at liberty to discuss any of those? So in terms of any new features, um, I wouldn't want to mention any of them, and mainly because uh, I don't want to like make any false promises. You know, um, there are a few things that we already discussed with the community that we really want to make, uh, and it's just about trying to prioritize everything and make the time to be able to go and code them. So, for for instance, uh, we released the woodpecker method, and that course in particular could benefit from a custom space repetition schedule so that people can study it either like the author suggests and they have an idea about how often you need to review those problems or how we suggest and we'd love to make that feature i mean i would love to i have an idea on how to do it but you know i've just discussed with you uh, i think i've got like one hour of programming time last week uh this this week's probably gonna be not much better than that um and you probably need like a good chunk of time like five to ten days of developing time to get that done so 
yeah, I wouldn't want to jump into feature sets just because we really need to to get back on track with um, like developing time, especially for myself. Um, although, as I said before, we are trying to increase our full-time headcount. So if we can do that successfully, maybe one of the other developers can take those things on and then um, we will be able to to discuss features uh, with more liberty. Um, but yeah, if anybody is interested, I mean, we have a, a feature suggestion um, discussion forum on the site and um, uh, most of the time the things are upvoted by the community and that get to the top, they get made. So, you know, it's not really a secret uh, <laughs> per se. Right. And one that I feel compelled to ask you about, I, th- I think you mentioned it in one of the interviews I read, but I'm sure it's near the top of the list is uh, apps, testable apps. So what's uh-huh. what's happening with those, if anything? Yeah, so that's um that's a common question we get, and um, yeah, first of all, I want to want to say that Chessable does work from from a tablet or from from an iPhone or, or Android device. Uh, you just have to open it in your web browser, and so, which is not ideal, we realize, uh, and we do want to get uh, something more like an app working, and it's, it's probably one of the top priorities next year, 2019. And um, how long it will take, we don't know the details yet because we're trying to. Um, yeah, figure out exactly how we're going to do it now. And depending on, on the way we go about it, it might either take longer or, or, or less. And um, yeah, once we have a better idea, we'll, we'll definitely uh, announce it. Okay, yeah, good to know. And yeah, we would keep an eye out for that. I'm sure it's uh, fine on a, on a browser as it is, but people people love their apps. So <laughs> I yeah. Ju- just yeah. thought I would ask. And uh, Yeah, for sure. Another project I wanted to ask about, and first of all, mention... Um, Geert van der Velt, creator of the intro music for Perpetual Chess, and yeah, yeah. big uh, chessable aficionado and uh, adult improver, and I'm sure he'll be on the show at some point, but he made a, a tactic series based on the Olympiad, uh, where like any you could see different tactics that players of, of you know varied levels from the Olympiad played, and uh, it's just basically a free way to practice your tactics from sort of mm. game tested ideas. And he subsequently no, uh, mentioned on Twitter that he's going to be doing a couple other things for Chessable. Um, are are you able to discuss what those are? Yeah. So, I mean, one of them is live now and it's a free tactics and strategy course uh, based in the world chess championship. So it's called um, Carlson Carana move by move. And um, yeah, he's put it out there for free. He's going to be working on it with Leon. He's going to be adding, basically the latest developments from the championship match onto it and it's it's completely free so that's one of the things that he's working on and um there are a couple of other things he, he he's working on and, and basically they're around um yeah using his skill set as a as a great chessable course creator his, his course was awesome uh, and helping us out um with a couple of courses that are kind of behind um on the backlog and yeah he's he's responsible for getting those live now and um yeah we're very grateful um to gear it for for his assistance in that and um yeah i think one of the courses that he's potentially uh working on is actually being top of his own course wish list uh so he's quite excited about that one cool yeah i look forward to finding out what it is and uh, I, I have a couple ideas of my own so when we're not recording um i don't want to divulge them but we we can discuss that as well and one thing <laughs> i just want to say for for any listeners who haven't checked out chessable so as as um as David has alluded to, of course, there's lots of books for sale and stuff like that, but there's stuff for free as well, such as uh, Geert's tactics thing, which it's just amazing that he put in that as much time as he did and donated, uh, I mean, and didn't charge for the product. And of course, also, you can upload your, your own repertoires and just practice through that um, up to a limited amount. So of course, those of you who are able to, I mean, this is a, a lean startup and it's a great product for the chess community. So I really encourage that you find a way to support them financially, whether it's through buying books or through their sort of subscription model. And that also dovetails into what I wanted to ask you about was how you came up with with your current business model in terms of sort of uh, the the freemium setup where some things are free and some are charged for and how you were able to figure out what to charge for and uh, like uh, Mm -hmm. how how it's going if you feel that it's um, a sustainable business model. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the key things we wanted to do is have a business model like immediately, um, you know, to begin charging immediately because you can only truly validate an idea once people are willing to put their, you know, hard earned money behind it. Um, so we didn't want to have everything for free uh, for, for that reason. And 
And but at the same time, we did want to have a lot for free because that's how people can get to know your products uh, with a very low uh, barrier to entry. So you know, I think given my background with social games, um, the majority of which follow a freemium model, um, I think it was kind of a logical um, choice for chess um, to go about it this way. Um, and you had another part to that question, which was about the price point. Um, price point wise. Uh, yeah, that that one's tough. I mean, we started like quite cheap, and then people who bought products with us two years ago will know this. Um, things cost like five dollars, and, and again, I think that's part of the kind of like you know just getting people's trust so that they know that um, you're there, you're gonna stay there, and um, they know what you're about, they know that you're reputable, and um, you know we have a thirty day money back guarantee, and we always stand by it, no questions asked. So you know we wanted we didn't want to create too too big a barrier there, uh, and it was cheap. But at the same time, as we keep growing, we have been increasing our price, and we've made no secret about it. Uh, and the reason is, um, you know, we need to hire developers, and we are competing with companies in, in various industries like I don't know finance, like you got banks, and and we're all vying for the same talent. So if we're going to encourage developers to join Chessable and work on chess, we, we need to be able to afford their salaries uh, and lure them to, to work with us. Uh, so we, we've increased the price to the point that we think it's both still a good buy to the cost, for the customer. Uh, it, it's a good price for our partners who, who all get a revenue share and, and there's enough left over for us to, to try and cover our costs uh, and so on. Yeah, so when you speak of the price, you're talking mainly about the price of the books themselves? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, because there's also a subscription model where in terms of uh, uploading your repertoire, there's a certain amount you can store and use on the Chessable server for free, and then there's a monthly subscription, and then you guys also have a lifetime subscription option. Yeah, so that's the pro membership, and um, it has quite a few useful features. Um, Like One of the top ones is like the ability to see um, uh, difficult moves and drill down into them like with much more precision than the standards algorithm. Um, yeah, people find that useful as well as uh, creating their own courses uh, based on their games or, or, or their opening repertoires. And yeah, the price point of that is about 60 a year and 90 for two years, some, something like that. And then there's the lifetime option, which is 250, I believe, or 290. Uh, around that um and actually we we try to price ourselves like you know relative to what everybody else is charging again um because uh i mean that one was a bit more 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 difficult to to price really than the the courses themselves um uh, personally i think the lifetime option is a steal right now so (laughs) i've been having second thoughts about that one lately but um um i'm 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 really not sure how you go about the price point i mean you, you could yeah i think it's too cheap right now basically <laughs> yeah it probably is so so hopefully some listeners will uh, will uh, jump on that before you change it <laughs> <laughs> well and, there are no no immediate plans to change it i mean uh, it's just my own feeling but um we don't we don't really want to mess with that one for now we, ha- we, we have our hands full with all these other things so it, it, yeah. it will stay at that for, for and, and as a while. growing company i mean if a listener were concerned that hey i i what if i buy a lifetime uh membership and then they go belly up uh, are there are there any concerns in that regard or no uh, there are definitely no concerns of going belly up i mean uh the way chessable is built like let let's say things like just like came to war to the worst right um you could still leave it running uh, with everything it has which is you know somebody part-time overseeing it what would happen is all the new features would stop coming right. on board and, and new content will probably stop getting released but the actual servers um they'll they'll stay running i mean and um people will be able to access the content indefinitely you know and this it's not expensive to run a server these days uh, as the actual cost of having developers look after it um so yeah i think we're here to stay for for a long long time and i mean right now we're growing uh, we have investors behind us um so yeah i still think it's a steal and uh, <laughs> the lifetime membership especially okay and i'm gonna ask you a sort of related question you've touched on it already but i want to get to our listener question and it means i get to get another crack at pr- pronouncing this listener's name correctly so all right. uh, always um a fun challenge for me so this question is from a friend of the podcast ashish Mukherjee. how did i do ashish i hope i got, i hope i got it right Mukherjee. he always spells it phonetically because i always butcher it so apologies and <laughs> fingers crossed now on to the question 
And she says, David, I'm a recent convert to Chessable and I'm a huge fan. It's the app I've wanted since 1986 when my rating hit 2000 and promptly stagnated. Considering how great it is, I'm surprised at the low number of users judging by the disc- judging by the discussion forums. I really want Chessable to succeed and thrive as a tech marketing guy. I've seen too many smart engineers ignore sales and marketing and too late. until too late. Are you doing enough on the marketing front and with the business model? Uh, great question, and th- thanks, uh, Ashish. And um, I, I, I would say that there's definitely two sides to that coin as well. Um, so, I mean, you could be doing too much marketing too soon, right? So right. it's about finding that sweet spot, uh, the balance. And um, yeah, we're definitely not ignoring marketing. We're just trying to pace it. Um, you know, as the founder, I'm probably the most dissatisfied person with our current feature set because I can see all these faults. I, I know all the bits that could be better, and uh, I just ye- yearn for the time to like disappear for a week and get it all done and make it perfect. Um, so you really want to polish it up as much as you can uh, um, and make it as streamlined as possible for a, a wide set of users before you go full on with the marketing. And I mean. Like looking at that question, you really can't judge how popular Chessable is by the discussion forums because it's actually not our kind of center point of the community. Like people go on Chessable and they stay on the homepage, they do the repetitions, they learn something new. Only a small percentage of people actually end up on the discussion forums. So we are we are growing, I think, at a quite healthy pace, and um, yeah, sometimes maybe even too fast, you know. So. Um, I think you had a question actually uh, before that you mentioned about um, our weekly active users growth, and um, we're on to ten thousand weekly users now. Oh wow! Because I think so, I saw a post from you on Indie Hackers in two thousand seventeen where you yeah. were in the three thousands, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we triple at least in the last year. So I think you know that's that's healthy enough growth and um i wouldn't want it to be much faster because otherwise i might not be getting any sleep (laughs) yeah 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 i mean busy with with your wife and kid as well so uh yeah i'm I'm sure that you wish you could clone yourself Um, oh yeah (laughs) so david i I also would be remiss if we didn't talk a little chess because your um your interest in chessable was born from just uh uh, catching the chess bug as basically all of our listeners have done um so what uh do you i know that for a while you had a chess improvement blog where you were uh playing in tournaments and competing on your own um are you still able to do that at all given given the constraints of uh this startup so my weekly study time has definitely taken a, a sharp turn for the worst <laughs> and the, the the more chessable grows and um Actually, if people go on my profile on Chessable, they'll be able to see by my activity graph that you know I've missed a few days here and there, and um, my little activity squares are not as blue as they used to be, uh, and that's just because there's so much more work uh, lately. But um, yeah, I mean, it's top of my priority list to be able to to get more and more involved with that. I mean, I twofold, like like you said, I love chess. I got a chess bug, so I want to be doing more of that, uh, and also um, as a startup. Um, founder, I think people should be using their own products so so that I get the best idea of of what the current state is, what's what's wrong with it, what's good with it, uh, and that kind of thing. So yeah, definitely need to be doing a bit more of that. And did you take chess up? Had you played as a kid at all? Yeah, so I played against one of my great uncles as a kid, uh, but you know, just let's say a few games a year. So he taught me the moves and. Um, you know, we had a few games, but then basically I picked chess up again, I'd say, when, 2011 or something, 2012, when one of my colleagues back then um, was playing and he challenged me to a few games. Um, we played online, we played uh, in person as well, and um, I think I must have been rated around 1,000 to 1,200 back then. Uh, so that's but, impressive uh, improvement. Um, I mean, you you downplay your chess ability, but to pick it up in your twenties and and get to to eighteen hundred fairly quickly is pretty good. Well, you know, I've stagnated for the last year and a half or two, so <laughs> yeah. Well, it happens, and you've got good excuses as as we've discussed. So, um, yeah, and uh, your your buddy John Bartholomew was just just on Twitter recently talking about. I saw that. I saw yeah, that. <laughs> about how, how hard it is for for adults to improve. Um, I, anyone on Twitter probably saw it. Uh, but if not, yeah. you should check it out. I mean, I, I, you know, we talk a lot about improvement and it can be done, but it's also important to have realistic expectations as basically the point that John was making. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I didn't really agree with that tweet. So. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, because I, actually, I mean, since you mentioned that, we might as well get into it. I mean, you you have a few older blog posts where you you were like, "I'm going to be a grandmaster," you know? I'm like, "I'm I I'm be the, a grandmaster." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I sense some de- defensiveness in your tone. I mean, I think that in a like in a parallel life, it, <laughs> it might be doable. But I exactly. I think what what John was getting at was like you know, you can't pretend that the other responsibilities of life don't exist. And because they do course, exist, that that's what creates the challenge for, for adults to, to continue exactly. to, to improve. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the only bit I don't agree about it is realistic expectations. I mean, I'm a very positive, like maybe over the top confidence uh, guy. And I like to set unrealistic expectations because then if you fall short, you're still doing quite well, you know, and I'm, yeah. I think that's, that's the beauty of it. So I mean, I would encourage people to keep setting those unrealistic expectations and keep going for it. Um, just, you know, don't be too bummed out if you fall short because that's part of the plan. You fall short, but you're still doing a good job. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like your business is going pretty well. So if it continues to grow, maybe you can uh, be on cruise control a little bit more and uh, put that time into your into your chess improvement. Yeah, I mean, um, any any company needs more downtime for any employee because um, during that time is sometimes when the magic happens, you know, your brain's free to just kind of like connect some ideas, come up with the next big thing. So everybody needs that 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 rest time, um, not not just the founders or the executive stuff. And um that's that's the goal you know just try and um rearrange things a little bit and um see if all of us can get a bit more of a breeder and then i'll definitely be funneling that time into my my chest study and chest improvements excellent yeah and i guess how old is your daughter she's two and a half. Oh, i have a two and a half year old as well um and oh. <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a fun age um yeah <laughs> and so do you think you'll be introducing her to chess in a few years for sure, yeah. I've been teaching her the name of the pieces already. I think that's um, a good start, and she she knows all of them. Um, she knows the night goes hop hop hop. So oh, that's great. That's <laughs> I didn't. She's ahead of mine. She would crush mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, do you have any uh, any favorite books, David? I mean, I've again, I've because I read a lot of your interviews, and because I'm just interested in the topic, I saw some sort of some business recommendations, but of course, also chess recommendations. Was there was there any book that that rocked your world whether chess or business uh, okay so let, let, let's look at chess first and i mean uh, back when i actually was buying more paper books i think one of my favorite ones was chess for zebras i think it was quite a nice reach and he had a few good ideas to discuss i think that's um jonathan rosen uh, chess um, for zebras i think is yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. sorry go ahead i get yeah, chess t- for zebras and chess for tigers mixed up <laughs> but yeah you're right. right yeah so i i found that quite quite an interesting read um uh, and lately i've been trying to look at um chess pattern recognition improve your chess pattern recognition which is on chessable and i find it quite interesting and useful uh and there's also forcing chess moves um uh, which i think is also quite good to to help you improve your um uh, forcing move calculation skills yeah, that one has been, it wasn't on my radar. And now it's one of those things where like something's in your consciousness and then you see it everywhere. <laughs> like uh, like uh, Christopher Chabri recommended it. And then I'm just seeing it listed everywhere and recommended everywhere. And I still haven't checked it out, but but I am eager to. Um, cool. And I'll share with you a copy on Chessable and can take oh, a look. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, what about business books? So business books, some of my favorites are The Lean Startup. And um, yeah, that one talks about how it is important to to take it a step at a time. You know, don't don't put all your eggs in one basket like straight away. And it's a philosophy I really follow closely for Chessable. You know, by uh, first making it a um, a private tool just for myself, and then showing it to John, and um, you know, then doing some work to it, um, some more polish, and releasing it in beta. And we were in beta for for a while. And then after we got through that stage, we went through the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. And um, yeah, I think it's quite important to to, to do it that way. Um, you know, you don't want to mortgage your house and, and, and put everything into it straight away. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There might be some ideas that need that. But, you know, that's quite quite a risky strategy that. Yeah. Um, um, in terms of other books, let's um, let's give a shout out to Founders at Work. And that's basically a book full of interviews of founders of different startups. And, and you can just kind of get a feel for um, the struggles and challenges that they've gone through and um, before finally, um, you know, either succeeding or, or, or failing. I'm not sure if any of those failed, but um, 
yeah, I think I think it's a great reach and uh, quite inspiring and motivating if anybody's trying to to do something similar. Cool. And um, maybe a shout out for our psychology books, which is um, mistakes were made by, but not by me. Uh, it's, huh. it's actually quite a fun, fun read. And um, you know, if I if I could actually have a, a another career as a professor in a university, I would try and make that my textbook for psychology 101. And, and it basically teaches you about human biases and um, you know that that kind of thing. And um, I think that's very important that that we're all aware of our shortcomings as humans. And um, highly recommend it. Yeah, that stuff is fascinating. And you went to grad school recently. Yeah, um, as as part of um, when I was starting Chessable App, I thought it'd be fun to you know have a baby and do a master's degree. Yeah, so. <laughs> why why not? Yeah, what could go I wrong? <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it was quite a tough year, but actually it was quite useful because I was able to um, organize all, uh, quite a bit of my coursework around chess and and psychology and chess and learning science and. You know, that's the good thing about um, grad courses. You, you can really tailor it to your professional interests. And um, yeah, that, that makes it more fun and, and more useful. Um, so, yeah, I did a, a master's in um, psychology of education a couple cool. of years ago. Oh, perfect fit. And dare I ask if you finished it? Yeah, yeah, I finished it. Um, awesome. That's yeah. pretty impressive, man. Congratulations. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, it was it was good fun. My, my dissertation was looking at... Um, expertise and um you know what's what it takes to become an expert or something and, and i tried to apply it to chess and um unfortunately it just fell short of of being published in a journal um due to sample size actually so i'm hoping to uh, rerun that experiment at some point in the near future maybe with some chessable users and, and and resubmit it for publication because um yeah i think there are a few interesting things that that i learned from that and and i'd like to share it with the you know the psychology community yeah, well, I mean, researchers, you know, dating back 100 years up to, to Anders Ericsson and the the current ones, they all find chess to be an interesting lab. So yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And um, yeah, we're hoping to do more of that with Chessville as well. We're actually working with the University of Sydney now, and they're trying to, to get some help from us on the platform to run some experiments uh, with chess. And um, yeah, I really find this stuff fascinating. So cool. And I think the last topic uh, that I would that I have on my list, at least, David, is in, in checking out your personal blog, I noticed that you linked to a site called Time Well Spent, yeah. uh, having to do with a responsible use of technology. Um, yeah. So how does that, does that go in conflict with the Chessable mission? Or is Absolutely it... not. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is part of my uh, the philosophy I'm living, you know, and I think technology should be used to do good and should help people use their time well instead of, you know, taking advantage of, of human uh, um, biases and uh, taking advantage of human um, uh, weaknesses. And, 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 you know, some people get addicted to some things. And, and that was one of the things I didn't like about, um, you know, my previous startup, that some people got really addicted to, to some of our games and not necessarily in a good way, you know, sometimes. And, um, yeah, we don't want any of that. And, um yeah, the philosophy is basically just making sure you build your technology responsibly, that you give people control and you give them the tools. So, for example, if somebody doesn't want to use Chessable, they can export their, their private courses and they can delete their accounts. They can you know, easily disable any notification that we send. Um, you know, it's just about trying to be transparent and and. and do a good job with your community. So you can also take a look at our uh, privacy policy in terms of use. There, it's written, you know, by lawyers as it has to be. But on the right side, we got a summary that's tried to like simplify what it's saying in plain English so people can read it. Um, you know, it, it's just that kind of thing. Um, trying to build responsible technology that that people can can use to to benefit their lives rather than um, like hindering their lives. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky issue for sure um yeah you know it's being in the press a lot with like some of the big companies that um you know have done some unethical things um to say the least the least you know <laughs> yeah yeah and and it's so hard to to avoid them you know like uh uh i mean i'm thinking of facebook yeah. in this case i mm -hmm. i sometimes i mean not a fan of a lot of the things they've done but it's hard to yeah you know, it's hard to grow a business without it, and it's uh, hard to stay yeah, in touch yeah. with people. So it's uh, so to, hard so to put the genie it, back yeah. in the bottle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just about like always taking a critical look at yourself and, and making sure that you don't stray too far from from this principle. Really, uh, when you're building the business, and I think you know, Facebook kind of might have forgotten about the people who use it for for a while. I mean, they're trying to 
to to fix it now, I think. But uh, you know, it might be too late. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say. And uh, one last question: I saw in some of your earlier interviews, you mentioned that you sort of had a vision beyond chess for Chessable, like in terms of a educational startup with uh, other uses. Is that is that still a part of the vision right now? Well, right now we. 100% concentrated and committed on chess, but uh, in the future, you know, why not? It could be uh, that we expand into something else, but for the time being, it, it's just chess for sure. So, David, is before I let you get back to your busy life, is there anything else that you would like to plug? Uh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, it'd be cool to um, give another shout out to authors and, and players out there who want to work with us, and um, we're trying to bring more top names to the platform. So we got GM, uh, Super GM, Harry Krishna publishing uh, a repertoire with us soon. But uh, yeah, we, we, want, we want to keep expanding the offering to, to our fans and, and keep working with authors to, to help them uh, release their, their courses. So if anybody out there knows anyone who might be interested or if you're interested, please get in touch. Cool, yeah, and obviously, as David attested with uh, with their weekly user base having tripled in the past year, it's a, it's a um, growing endeavor, um, and I think it's uh, it's um, sort of the way the wind is blowing in terms of uh, um, chess books and the way that they will be sold in the future. So, whether you're an established or an aspiring author, I would recommend trying it out. Just out of curiosity, when an author uh, makes a like writes a book for you guys. Um, do they write it generally through the platform or do they like write it in prose or a PGN and then adapt it for Chessable if it's a, a product such as uh, Christoph's um, E4 products and Petrov products and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, it's very flexible. You can start working on it the way you're used to. So whatever your, chess, your favorite chess program is, you can use that and then just give us a PGN and uh, we import it into the site or you can import it yourself or you can work on it inside Chessable, um, it, it's really very flexible. And um, yeah, we can provide different levels of support uh, depending on, on who needs what. And um, yeah, we try to, to give a hand to everybody. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so anyone interested, your email address, David, is? David at Chessable.com. Okay, easy enough. Excellent. <laughs> easy. Well, well, David, thanks again for coming on. This was a lot of fun. And I, I'm really excited to see what, what Chessable does in the coming years and to hopefully find some more time to take advantage of your cool product. Uh, great, Ben. Thanks a lot. And I hope um, your podcast keeps growing because it's, it's really, really good stuff. And um, I'll keep listening to it. And good luck with it. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music, Matthew Passy, my esteemed producer, and everyone who's written a good review on Apple Podcasts or other podcast platforms or told a friend about the show. Every little bit helps. But of course, I'm most indebted to those who donate to support the show. Without you guys, the show would not be possible. And I want to give special thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. Here are your names. I'm slowly but surely correcting some mispronunciations. So let's see how I do this time. Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Ali Morchetti, Andres Krizdwa, Brian Mullis, Carl Labans. I am Carlos Perdomo of ChessAtlanta.com, Chad Hilton, Chad Oliver, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood. I am Christoph Zilicki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas, Daniel Naylor, Daniel D. Schaefer, Daniel Vine E., Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Agard, James Bonastia, Jason Woolham, Jennifer Valens of OffTheRook.com, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Hartman, John Jernigan, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Leo Delgado, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passi, Macaulay Peterson of the Full English Breakfast, Matthew Tedesco, Nate Salon, Nathan Webster, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahalva, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, Ryan Stone, Steiner Lima, Stuart Katz, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, 
Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouge, Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Soyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. Catch you guys soon. Mm-hmm.